Listen now to a talk Ben Friedman had with Dr. Luigi DiBiase, Associate Professor of Medicine at the Einstein College of Medicine in New York City. They cover effects of empirical left atrial appendage isolation on long-term outcomes in patients with long-standing, persistent atrial fibrillation undergoing catheter ablation. What I wanted to ask you about is what was the reason that you chose the long-standing persistent to do a study in? Thank you very much, Dr. Friedman, for the opportunity, and I have the pleasure tomorrow to present the result of this trial on, on behalf of the principal investigator, Dr. Andrea Natale. So the reason why we chose patients with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation is because these are the most difficult patients to treat in general, and especially in the settings of catheter ablation. The reported results in the literature are really poor at an extended follow-up. What would you expect from the literature if you were looking at follow-up over five years or so? Yeah, the five years follow-up uh, report results that are very poor, around 20%, 24%. A two-year follow-up with multiple procedures, they never go upper than 50%, and with single procedure around 40%. And uh, this, when limiting the ablation to the pulmonary vein, plus some other area, but really limiting the procedure to pulmonary vein. So really, we're talking about something that's not been terribly successful when you've got really long-standing persistent. How long-standing is long-standing? Well, you know, we have followed the definition of long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, so all these patients had to be in atrial fibrillation for at least one year, and we followed this for the inclusion criteria. And did most of them in the trial that you did, and I guess in the people who come to ablation, have most of them already had at least one cardioversion or been on drugs to produce cardioversion and failed? Yes, all of them had failed this. Okay, so the current approach is to just empirically do the pulmonary vein isolation, is that right? Yes, I like the word that you use, empirical, because, you know, we currently do pulmonary vein isolation without really seeing the trigger from each of the veins. So the ablation procedure of patient with atrial fibrillation, it's well established to isolate the pulmonary vein. And in patient with non-paroxysmal patient, other area are interested in the ablation. We showed in 2010 that the left atrial appendage is an underreported trigger site of atrial fibrillation. And we did appendage isolation already in 2010 in a series of patients non-randomized. Okay, can you tell me how you determine whether there's a trigger? We use isoproterenol tests. We use high dosage of isoproterenol up to 20, 30 micrograms per minute. Okay, that's quite a high dose. Yes, high dose. And by positioning several multipolar carotid in the heart, we are able to visualize earlier activation that are considered for us non-PV trigger for atrial fibrillation. Okay, and so in your earlier study, when you found those left atrial appendage triggers, what did you do? So in the earlier study, the definition of non-PV trigger was not based on a sustained arrhythmia, but even non-sustained arrhythmia such as consistent PAC were enough to define that area as a non-PV trigger. And the appendage was reported in that series to be responsible for atrial fibrillation in patients with isolated veins in 27% of the patients. So these are already isolated veins and they're having recurrent atrial fibrillation. Exactly. And when you went to look with your provocation study with isoproterenol, you found that there are a lot of triggers and when you got rid of those triggers, you were able to reduce or improve the outcome. Is that right? Yes. And what we found is that it was not a focal ablation that was important to achieve long-term follow-up, but it was isolation of the entire appendage to get rid of the atrial fibrillation at follow-up. So we decided at this point we should design a trial that does an empirical isolation of the appendage and compare this to a group of patients where the isolation of the appendage is determined by the visualization of the non-PV trigger. Okay, and so that's the belief trial that you're going to be presenting. So tell me, what was your usual practice to which you added the empirical isolation of the left atrial appendage? What would you call usual? Yes, our standard procedure in patients with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation has been you know, extensively described in our series from our group, but basically we do an extended pulmonary vein antrum isolation, which uh, isolates the pulmonary vein and extends to the posterior wall. 
then we extend our lesion set to the so-called non-PV triggers, which includes in the majority of the patients, the coronary sinus and the roof and the anterior part of the septum. In addition, it's important to say that an empirical superior venocava isolation is added if PV-like potential are found in this structure. Okay, and to that mix of what you normally do, you did an empirical isolation or just an isolation only if you saw potential? Exactly. And how many patients did you include in this study? We included 173 patients, 85 patients were randomized to empirical isolation of the appendage and 88 instead were randomized to no appendage isolation unless a documented sustained firing was observed. And all of these, if I'm correct, all of these were long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation? All of them had long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. About how old were they? The patient had an average of 64, 65 year old. And the CHADSVAS score? 40 to 45 percent of the patient had a CHADSVAS more than two. CHADSVAS more than two? More than two. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can you summarize your finding? Yes, we found that the group that underwent empirical left atrial appendage isolation had a better outcome at the primary endpoint, which was the 12 months follow-up, where we had a success rate of around 56% versus 28%. And when repeat procedures were added, and importantly, in the repeat procedures, the left atrial appendage was empirically isolated in all patients, the success rate increased to 76% in the empirical left atrial appendage isolation group versus 56% in the second group that had an empirical isolation in the repeat procedure. Can you tell me how you defined or how you looked for the recurrence of atrial fibrillation in these people? Yes, in this patient we use, the, you know, what is the standard of care. Basically, we do a clinical evaluation. We use an ECG at the clinical evaluation, seven-day halter monitoring, and event recorder where patients were asked to transmit their rhythm irrespective of their symptoms. That's really a very impressive difference. Obviously, the numbers are not huge, but this is not a very large population of people who've got long-standing persistent where we go in. I mean, many of us don't even bother with the long-standing persistent to control them. Was there any reason why these patients you chose to do a procedure? This is, you know, an eternal dilemma in the field of atrial fibrillation. You believe in rhythm control versus rate control. I think that there is data out that suggests that staying in sinus rhythm is better for the patients. And rate control strategy are very difficult to be achieved. So I do believe that this is better. How would your results contrast with from the literature? You say this was 76% with two procedures. Average of 1.3 procedures. If you look at what's been reported in the past, what would you have expected at two years? Well, at with two... repeat procedures, that is. Yes, I think that no study has shown really nothing better than 50 to 55 percent. So I think that 76 percent is an important result to be achieved. And what's your take home message then? There is still a lot to learn. There is a physiopathology to be understood about atrial fibrillation, but the evidence from the clinical ablation field is that while adding this structure as a component of the ablation procedure, we have higher chance to achieve sinus rhythm at follow-up. And maintain it. So I guess we need to look much more closely at the left atrial appendage and isolate it empirically rather than even do your provocative tests for the left atrial appendage. Yes, I think this is, would be the take-home message. And also we'll remember, you know, if you look at the cox maze procedure in early era, all patients had an appendage removed. So I think this matters. With okay, the yes, I guess that's the ultimate in left atrial appendage removal. So thanks very much for joining us and presenting your results from Belief. Thank you so much.